Hi, well, uh, thank you for having me. Um, it's great to be here in this beautiful weather on the West Coast uh, from Washington, D.C., where we've had a mild uh, fall, but nothing like this. Uh, so it's uh, quite, quite beautiful. Uh, so I want to thank uh, Clark Roof uh, and uh, the CAP Center uh, here at UCSB for having me out, and uh, thank all of you uh, for gathering here. And to start this off on a cheery tone, I'm going to read a little bit uh, from the, uh, just to kick, kick, give you some flavor of from uh, the beginning of the book uh, that is an obituary uh, for white Christian America. Um, start us off in a nice cheery tone uh, here. After a long life spanning nearly 240 years, white Christian America, a prominent cultural force in the nation's history, has died. White Christian America first began to exhibit troubling symptoms in the 1960s when white mainline Protestant den denominations began to shrink, but showed signs of rallying with the rise of the Christian right in the 1980s. Following the 2004 presidential election, however, it became clear that white Christian America's powers were failing. Although examiners had not been able to pinpoint the exact time of death, the best evidence suggests that white Christian America finally succumbed in the latter part of the first decade of the 21st century. The cause of death was determined to be a combination of environmental and internal factors, complications stemming from major demographic changes in the country, along with religious disaffiliation, as many of its younger members begin to doubt white Christian America's continued relevance in a shifting cultural environment. Among white Christian America's many notable achievements was its service to the nation as a cultural touchstone during most of its life. It provided a shared aesthetic, a historical framework, and a moral vocabulary. White Christian America's vibrancy was historically one of the most prominent features of American public life. While the common cultural ground it offered did not prevent vehement or even bloody conflicts from erupting, the lingua franca of white Christian America gave them a coherent frame. But white Christian America has not been without its critics and controversies. Its reputation was especially marred by its general accommodation to and participation in the institution of slavery up until the Civil War. In the late 19th and 20th centuries, white Christian America's apathy toward, and in some quarters even staunch defense of, segregation in the American South did little to overturn these negative associations. Its credibility was also damaged when it became mired in partisan politics in the closing decades of the 20th century. Late in its life, white Christian America also struggled to adequately address issues such as lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender rights, which were of particular importance to its younger members, as well as to younger Americans overall. White Christian America is survived by two principal branches of descendants, a mainline Protestant family residing primarily in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, and an evangelical Protestant family living mostly in the South. Plans for a public memorial service have not been announced. Um, uh, so that's the kickoff uh, to the book. I, um, I think it may be the only book that's primarily a sociology book that begins with an obituary and ends with a eulogy. Um, uh, but I want to take you a little bit on a journey of the life and death of white Christian America and land us somewhere about where we are about a week out ahead of the election. Um, uh, so you'll be relieved to know that nowhere in the book uh, do I mention Donald Trump, uh, nowhere in the book do I mention Hillary Clinton. Uh, so this book was kind of wrapped and closed before the current dynamics, uh, the specific candidates at least, uh, got off the ground. But I, but I think it actually, um, uh, that's a good thing, I think, but I, I think it has a lot to say about the dynamics uh, that underlie um, what's going on that are not particular to the candidates, but are much deeper uh, than that. Um, so, you know, that actually takes me to this picture um, that's here on this opening slide. You've been staring at it for a while, even if you haven't been paying attention to it. Um, and, you know, it's always worth asking, like, you know, where did the seeds of a, a book idea begin or what, pr what uh, prompted an author to write a book? And you know, one of the, the things that's really started me thinking along the lines of, of um, the thing that eventually became this book was receiving this email. I received an email with this photograph on the top of it um, about a week after Barack Obama was reelected for president in 2012. Um, and I received the, the email from the Christian Coalition of America. Um, so that's a conservative kind of Christian activist group uh, that was kind of a key part of the conservative Christian movement in the 1980s and 90s, and still has a kind of presence today, although a much more diminished one. Uh, but I received this uh, photo. So just take a minute to check it out, right? So it was, this is exactly how it came. Uh, so it was black and white, um, this, this photo. And at the bottom, there's a little caption on the bottom that said, 
um, Christian Family at Prayer, Pennsylvania, 1942. All right, and so that's why the photograph's black and white. But if you'll kind of interrogate it, you'll notice a few things, right? So uh, there's a male head of household at the end of the table, uh, right, kind of uh, conducting prayer and presiding over the family uh, thing. Uh, it also, I think, not um, unconsciously um, evokes a Norman Rockwell uh, painting. Maybe some of you, the Freedom from Want, uh, Norman Rockwell painting has also a family with a kind of uh, the uh, mother and her father leaning over this great big turkey uh, in, the, in the painting. Um, but what struck me was, was it, it also seemed kind of odd to get this right after Barack Obama um, was reelected. But then when I, when I read further down on the email, and I'm gonna read you just a short excerpt here of what was uh, actually in the email, um, you know, it was a little eyebrow raising. Um, so here's what it said right under uh, this email. Um, we will soon be celebrating the 400th anniversary of the first Thanksgiving. And God has still not withheld his blessings upon this nation, although we now richly deserve such condemnation. We have a lot to give thanks for, but we also need to pray to our Heavenly Father and ask him to protect us from those enemies outside and within who want to see America destroyed. All right, so really strong. I mean, this is apocalyptic language, right, about, and it's right around the re-election of our first African-American president. Um, and and um, one of the things that had always been bugging me a little bit about our current political context was that it always seemed like there was way more heat uh, to our debates about particular issues than perhaps there should be, right? They were visceral. They, they always went into this kind of um, uh, apocalyptic key. And that was whether we were talking about, like, you know, uh, health care uh, policy or immigration policy. I mean, one might expect that around the most contentious kind of cultural issues, maybe around abortion or something like that, but it seemed to just kind of bleed into every debate that we were having, kind of went into this, um, you know, just kind of over-the-top uh, rhetoric. And, and so I begin to wonder, like, what's going on there? Um, and it, it, it um, uh, kind of the analogy I sometimes give, it, it really ended up making me think of a kind of dysfunctional couple's relationship, right? Um, where uh, you end up with a sort of fight over something dumb, uh, over, uh, you know, uh, saying uh, who left the dishes in the sink, who left the, the wet towel on the floor, uh, and, you know, around the, you know, you end up with like a two-hour argument, and about the first hour, uh, at that one-hour mark, you realize, oh, you know what, we're not really arguing over the dishes in the sink anymore, we're like arguing over something much deeper and bigger in the relationship, right, and the, the argument just mushrooms. Uh, and it seemed to me that we as a country were in a place like that, um, that, even, that all the kind of particulars that we were arguing about, that we were really arguing about something much deeper and much bigger um, in the country that was sort of expressing itself in all of these little ways. So one of the things that I hope the book um, will do is uh, to kind of name some of the losses and name uh, some of the huge transitional changes that we've been through in a way that I hopefully can get us to a place where we can at least name those things uh, to get to a healthier, uh, a healthier conversation um, in the country. So I'm going to tell a little bit of a story um, using uh, a couple of uh, some buildings uh, and also some numbers. Um, I'll try uh, not to get too down in the weeds uh, with, with too, many, too many stats, uh, but uh, we'll kind of look at the patterns in some of the charts uh, that I'm going to show you. But I, I think it's important to kind of really take in just how dramatic uh, some of the changes um, that we've, uh, we've been experiencing um, in the country are. Uh, before I go too far, though, I do want to make sure I'm, I want to clarify what I mean by this term white Christian America, because I use it really as a metaphor um, for this cultural and institutional world that was built really primarily by white Protestant uh, Christians um, in the country. Um, there was a historian I was, I was using, um, uh, looking at some of the, um, the data in the 20th century, uh, and she, she put it this way. She said, look, you know, if you were in charge of something big and important uh, in the middle of the 20th century, chances are you were white, you were male, and you were Protestant. Um, you know, that, that was kind of the cultural norm. Uh, certainly there were exceptions, but that was kind of the cultural norm uh, in the middle of the 20th century. Um, and so it, the, the book, when I talk about the end of white Christian America, it is, what I'm talking about really is the end of that cultural dominance of this white, particularly Protestant, uh, world uh, in the country, uh, both at the institutional level and at the cultural uh, level as well. 
Uh, so I'm going to uh, kind of walk us through just some of those uh, changes. So I'm going to start, uh, kind of warm you up before I get to numbers. I'm going to start with uh, some buildings. Um, and uh, so this is, a, this is a, a still shot from the video of One World Trade Center uh, video that they now have um, in the elevators. This is a great feature that if you go in the elevator and you go up to the viewing platform, they start you off, um, it's a floor to ceiling video panel, and they start you off um, really pre human uh, 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 inhabitation in lower Manhattan. So you see like a swamp and some uh, ducks and stuff like that. And as you go up, the, uh, the timeline goes up. And you start seeing the early Dutch settlers showing up uh, in New York and little houses popping up. Uh, this is a still from 1795. So I like stopped it right there. It's, I'm not quite sure if you can, um, how well you can see it, but it's this little, Uh, is a great big steeple, um, and that is, some of you may know what it is or may have a good guess, that's Trinity Chapel, uh, right on the southern tip of Manhattan. It was a big Episcopalian uh, church. And one of the striking things about this is just, I think it's hard for us sometimes uh, to, given our, the way our modern cities look, to remember that it was only about 100 years ago that in most major cities in the country, if you scan the horizon, the thing you would see is not skyscrapers and kind of monuments to commerce, but you would see usually steeples uh, were the things that sort of punctuated the skyline. Uh, there were big clocks on, on many of these that kind of punctuated the day. The church bells rang on holidays uh, or major events in the country, elections and those kinds of things to kind of help mark uh, the time, but it was very much part of people's um, consciousness. Um, I was just kind of up here today, like the big mission right here, up, up here on the hill, right? Served the same function before there was a lot of built up. I mean, that was a really iconic structure right up on top of the hill that really did, no matter where you were, you could see that. Uh, and it really imprinted itself, I think, on people's um, consciousness. Of course, you know, this is what uh, the southern tip of Manhattan looks like today, right? And Trinity Chapel is still there. Um, it's just buried down in these, uh, in between this valley of uh, big, big, huge uh, uh, buildings. But even in New York, um, this didn't happen until the late 19th century. Uh, or, uh, yeah, late 19th century. Uh, and so all the way up until the late 19th century, the steeples were still the kind of biggest things, even in a city um, like New York. Um, now I'm going to shift to talk about some very specific buildings that I think just help tell the story a little bit um, about um, the kind of rise and decline and the aspirations of this world of white Christian America that never quite really came into being. Um, this building on the left um, is a building, I'm, I'm from Washington, D.C. This building is in Washington, D.C. It is the United Methodist uh, building. Um, it's the only religious structure on Capitol Hill. Um, and if you've been there, it's a kind of triangular, you can tell it's built in kind of a wedge shape. If you look out um, one side of that building, there's a big plate glass window, you see the Supreme Court building. And if you sort of look out the front and you look right across the street, you see the U.S. Capitol. Uh, so it's in a built like right there, um, uh, kind of at the intersection of the Supreme Court and the U.S. Capitol building. At the time um, it was built, um, they were calling it a, um, a Protestant Sentinel on Capitol Hill, right? So this, this idea that it was going to look over and sort of manage uh, legislation and be a kind of broker of power uh, there. They even built like apartments on the back with the idea that like senators and congressmen would uh, rent apartments there and they would be rubbing shoulders with uh, the kind of uh, lawmakers uh, um, uh, of the day. Uh, it never quite realized its full potential. And, and, and it was, it's notable because it was built by a single uh, denomination, the United Methodist, uh, which were, at the time was by far the largest Protestant denomination um, in the country, um, and uh, it was built in 1920. Um, and uh, but but today uh, it really has morphed into um, this very multi-religious space, right? So uh, the Islamic Society of North America now has offices in there. In addition, the United Methodists are still there, uh, but there's uh, uh, several Jewish groups. There's also some uh, non-religious um, uh, NGO groups in there as well. So it's this very kind of pluralistic space. Um, so just kind of, you know, one just kind of uses as a place marker is something that's gone from being an expression of power of one particular Protestant denomination that really had aspirations of being kind of America's conscience um, in a way um, to being now this kind of very multi-religious and pl pluralistic space. Um, the building on the right um, over there is 
uh, the Inter-Church Center in New York, sometimes affectionately called the God Box, um, because of its kind of architectural, uh, you know, boxiness, uh, the fortress-like look. Um, so this building was built uh, in 1960, and it was kind of a second wave of Protestant, kind of expressions of Protestant power. At the time this building was built, it was called the closest thing to a Protestant Vatican the world will ever see. Um, and it was, it was also, when they were raising money for it, it was also really about um, this being this expression of kind of white Protestant Christianity, predominantly white Protestant Christianity in the country. Um, it, and again, think about the kind of power this thing had, uh, this building had, and, and the groups that were there had it held the National Council of Churches, which was the kind of ecumenical body uh, at the time of uh, mostly white Protestant groups. And when it was, uh, when it, the cornerstone was laid actually by President Eisenhower, uh, sitting, so a sitting president came and laid the cornerstone uh, for the building. 30,000 people uh, showed up uh, for, uh, for, its, for its opening. John D. Rockefeller Jr. donated the money and the land for the building. It's limestone all the way up, uh, marble interiors. It's a very, very substantial building meant to express a kind of cultural power um, and influence. Um, and it housed, again, this kind of, uh, it was meant to really be the headquarters of the National Council of Churches. Um, and, you know, today it has a very similar function. It's still there, um, although the National Council of Churches, as its resources have shrunk um, over time, has now abandoned that building and has now moved in with the Methodist uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, and the, the building uh, there now has um, kind of an inter-religious uh, seminary. It also has um, a bunch of, like Columbia University now has a bunch of offices, a biking advocacy group. It's a, a hodgepodge of a bunch of different groups uh, in this building, uh, in addition to uh, several religious groups as well. But, you know, does, didn't, never quite got to be the kind of Protestant Vatican that its, uh, that its founders really um, envisioned uh, for it. Uh, the final one, uh, this one may be a little more familiar since we're out here on the West Coast. Any, any takers? Crystal Cathedral, yes. Uh, uh, so, you know, this uh, was founded in the 80s uh, by Robert Schuller uh, and his min ministries uh, there. Uh, when this building was built, uh, the New York Times, a huge splashy write-up uh, when it was built, uh, uh, called it perhaps the most significant religious building since the construction of the th uh, cathedral at Notre Dame. Uh, is what they said about it. Beverly Sills sang at the opening. Uh, Sinatra showed up. I mean, it was a huge, uh, it was a huge deal. Um, it has 10,000 individual panes of glass in the main structure uh, here. Um, it, it was just an amazing, uh, amazing building. Um, and uh, as many of you may have known, because this is more, this is closer to home, uh, that uh, now Robert Schuller's uh, ministry is bankrupt, right? And ended up selling the building uh, to the Catholic Diocese of LA. Um, which now has converted it to be a actual cathedral, um, a sort of a Christ cathedral, uh, and it now holds multi-ethnic churches in four different languages. Right in in this uh, in this building, and because of the changing, uh, the, there's now you know very very uh, different uh, demographics uh, than it was when Robert Schuller built. Uh, built his building. Uh, so that's just kind of a sense of kind of some of these, you know, t the first two waves of kind of more liberal and mainline uh, kind of rise and decline, and then just one expression of the kind of evangelical megachurch uh, movement that's kind of come and crested uh, a bit uh, as well. So what does this look like if we actually just look at some data? Um, so um, if I had only one slide uh, to show you, it probably would be this one. Uh, I am unfortunately going to show you some more. But uh, if, this, if I could only show you one, um, it would be this one. Because I think it really helps um, us understand just how much cultural change is going on. Uh, and so I'll, I'll kind of foreshadow a little bit. I'm going to come to it at the end. But you know, one of the things we've seen in this election cycle is just like big expressions of anxiety, anger, uh, you know, those kinds of emotions uh, in the election cycle. Um, you know, this is, I think, one slide that may tell you, give you some clues about why, particularly if you're a conservative white Christian in the country, why you might be a little anxious uh, right now. Uh, so the, the, the blue line here is the percent of Americans who identify as white, non-Hispanic, and Christian. And this is Christian of any kind, by the way. So it, this is Protestant, Catholic, uh, Orthodox, uh, non-denominational, all lumped together. So any white Christian uh, who's not Hispanic. Uh, and it, I kind of colored in this uh, side on the right uh, of Obama's presidency. And so if you just look kind of 2008 uh, to the present, I think is a good way to kind of get a gl glimpse of the change. So when Barack Obama was first running for president, two, just two election cycles ago, 54% of the country identified as white 
and Christian. Uh, so solid majority white Christian country. Uh, if you go down, you can see that number starting to decline um, over the last eight years. Uh, and this chart has 2015 data on it. We just, um, a couple of weeks ago, released one more uh, set of numbers on this. Uh, that number has now gone to 43. Uh, percent, right? So it was, uh, it was, it's interesting to kind of note how quickly it's changed. When I wrote the book, I was using 2014 data. Uh, the number was 45% white Christian. Uh, then we had 2015 data, it went to, uh, sorry, it was 47. Then I went 2015 data, it went to 45. 2016 data, it went to 43, right? So it's just kind of dropping uh, fairly, fairly quickly in the country. So from 54% all the way down to 43, if you add one more data point on the end there. Um, and then if you think about a kind of cultural bellwether issue, uh, the give you a read on, on the culture, on cultural change, um, this issue of support for same-sex marriage. Uh, when Barack Obama was running for president, again, 2008, two election cycles ago, uh, only four in 10 Americans supported uh, same-sex marriage, right? Um, and Barack Obama himself did not support uh, same-sex marriage in 2008. Uh, but today, um, that number has gone to um, over there in 53%. Uh, we just also had the, the same survey was just a couple of weeks ago. That number jumped to 62 uh, percent this year, right? So we're now looking at it's gone from four in ten to six in ten uh, Americans who support same-sex marriage. Now, again, if you're a conservative white Christian, right, who opposes same-sex marriage as a matter of faith, um, this is a head-spinning amount of change. Right, you've gone from being a demographic majority in the country to being a demographic minority. You've gone from being uh, a, feeling like the country is sort of on your side on a really key bellwether issue uh, to realizing you're very much in the minority um, in the country. And I think this is part of the kind of vertigo and sense of alienation uh, that we're getting, I think, from some white Christian quarters um, this, this election cycle. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but um, this kind of lays the, the basic ground uh, for just the, the real changes that we've seen um, in the country. Um, so here is uh, just a kind of pie chart. Again, this is 2014 data um, showing uh, kind of white Christians of all stripes uh, here in blue, uh, the, and about a quarter of the country um, uh, being uh, sort of non-white Christian. But the one I want to draw attention to here is this 22% up here on the top, this big orange wedge, because this is actually part of the story. Here. So part of the story about the decline of white, Christian, uh, white Christians in the country is demographic change, right, due to immigration patterns, particularly immigration from Mexico and other uh, Latin American countries, uh, and then also uh, declining birth rates among whites. So there hasn't been generational uh, um, replacement. But that doesn't really get you to the kind of decline that we're seeing. Um, what, there's an internal factor, and that is uh, the number of particularly white Christians who are leaving white Christian churches, uh, right? And so this number is 22% uh, of the country uh, in, in 2014 uh, uh, claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. So when you ask them, what is your religion? Are you Protestant? Are you Catholic? Are you Jewish? Uh, what, et cetera, et cetera. They would say nothing uh, in particular to, the, to that question. Uh, that number today, by the way, has ticked up again to 25% in surveys just last month. Uh, so that means a quarter of Americans today uh, claim no religious affiliation. And if you look at young younger Americans, those under the age of 30, the number is 39%, right? So four in 10 of Americans who are under the age of 30 claim no religious affiliation whatsoever. Um, and to give you kind of some perspective on this, in the, in the 1990s, only 6% of Americans claim no religious affiliation. So it's basically quadrupled uh, just since the 1990s, the number of Americans claiming no religious affiliation. So it's this movement, this sort of outflow combined with the demographic change uh, in the country that really has given us um, this very dramatic uh, shift um, in the country. Um, you can see it here if I just sort of break out uh, kind of religious, racial and religious identification by age. You, um, I like to kind of think about this as a little bit of an archaeological dig down through generational strata. Um, so you kind of think about the kind of youngest Americans on top and older Americans on the bottom. And you know, basically, you see here that seniors, um, uh, two thirds of seniors, uh, identify as white and Christian, but only 29% of Americans under the age of 30 um, identify as white and Christian. Now, what's remarkable about this too is that you can just take a ruler and draw a straight line. It's absolutely linear, um, right, uh, by generation. You could draw uh, a very, very uh, clear, you know, almost 45 degree uh, line through this. So it's very clear just over the generations that are alive right now, uh, this is how much change we're seeing from seniors uh, down to the millennial generation, the youngest uh, generation uh, of American adults. 
Uh, here's the other uh, lines up there, and again, you can see the uh, religiously unaffiliated line up there. You know, it's only about one in ten for seniors, um, and it's what is it, 34 percent in that data, but it, it's actually up to 39 uh, percent, uh, 39 percent today. Uh, one other thing that, that uh, this now being uh, where we are in California, and this will not surprise you perhaps, uh, but we are seeing um, this is the number. This is the uh, by state. Uh, states where white Protestants in particular uh, still make up a majority. The dark blue are places where white Protestants still make up a majority of the country. As you can see, there's not that many places right, in the country where white Protestants are still a majority of the country. Um, one little game I'm going to play is I'm going to put this map up uh, next to the election map, uh, I think, in, in uh, 2008. Uh, you might notice some similarities, right, in, this pa in, the, pa in the patterns between red and blue uh, and this. And this is just one variable. This is just, like, percent of Americans who, uh, in each state who uh, uh, are, are white and Christian. Uh, but this tells you, and, and it's kind of shrinking, uh, you know, it, so at, over time, the number of states kind of get taken off, um, uh, taken off the map. Uh, and, you, and what you really see is it's the Deep South and Appalachia, right, is really where you see the kind of highest concentrations there. Um, and it's, it's, it's maybe not, um, uh, you know, coincidental that, I mean, these are also places where, for example, Donald Trump has been very strong. Uh, this is the kind of Appalachian region of, of, of the country. Uh, it's been hit hard heck economically, but also experiencing a lot of cultural change uh, and a real sense that uh, the kind of culture that they have in their local communities is no longer really reflected in the country um, as a whole. Um, all right, so what about politics? So that's kind of what's going on in the, in the, uh, the general population. Um, but I thought I'd uh, kind of take you a little bit about where we are in the vote and how, and what, how these changes might impact us at the ballot box. Because uh, changes in, the, in uh, the country, they they impact the ballot box, but because of differential turnout rates, uh, sometimes it's a little bit uh, delayed or, um, or um, a little bit uh, different in terms of its um, ratios. But here's what's remarkable um, about uh, voting patterns in the country, is that basically since Ronald Reagan, uh, the voting patterns by race and religion have been very, very stable. Uh, and, it's, and it's also very, very simple. Uh, you, could, you could accurately characterize virtually every election since Reagan uh, as this kind of alignment of white Christians leaning toward Republican candidates and kind of everybody else leaning toward Democratic. Uh, candidates, uh, and you know, you, so you can see here. This this chart shows um, ditch support for Democratic presidential candidates. It just showed one side for simplicity over time. And what you can see is these kind of three groups on the left: white evangelicals, white Catholics, white mainline Protestants, all below 50 percent, right? And and it doesn't kind of the interesting thing here too is that you know there's very different candidates, so it doesn't really matter. The candidates don't change the equation that much. So if you think this is George W. Bush, John McCain, and Mitt Romney, like those are really different uh, candidates at the top of the ticket, and yet the patterns look really similar uh, across time. And then you see um, over on the other side, uh, Hispanic Catholics, uh, religiously unaffiliated uh, folks, um, uh, Jewish Americans, uh, and African American Protestants strongly supporting uh, Democratic uh, presidential candidates um, across, uh, across those, those election cycles. Um, the current, here's our latest data um, and our kind of best pre-election snapshot of the religious vote as it kind of currently stood, well, as it stood as of October 17th. Um, and uh, this is based on a fairly sizable group of, um, of likely voters. Uh, and what you'll see here is that basically you have white evangelical Protestants, um, the most strongly, uh, most, group most strongly supporting uh, Donald Trump, two-thirds uh, supporting Donald Trump. White mainline Protestants leaning that direction, but less, less so. Um, white Catholics, um, or sorry, Catholics as a whole, I'll get to white Catholics in a minute, leaning toward Hillary Clinton, and then the, this starts getting heavier as you go down non-Christian religions, uh, unaffiliated African-American Protestants. Um, you also note the very, very low support for Donald Trump, only 3% uh, support for Donald Trump among African-American Protestants. That's kind of unprecedented uh, in, uh, in pre-election uh, polling that, that we've done. But that's the basic pattern, and it looks pretty consistent, right? It's kind of white, basically white, white evangelical Protestants, white mainland Protestants, uh, and I'm going to break Catholics here in a minute so you can see the Catholic break. Um, so here's uh, all Catholics at the top, uh, white Catholics, non-white Catholics. Uh, Non-white Catholics are um, overwhelmingly Latino. Uh, there's also African Americans and Asian Pacific Islanders. Uh, there too, overwhelmingly Latino though. But you know, look at this this break. It's just huge. Um, you know, it's like 30 points uh, between white and non-white uh, Catholics uh, here. And here's the other side, just so you can kind of see it. 
so what's interesting about the white Catholics is that um, they, they went, white Catholics went uh, for Romney by 19 points uh, in 2012. And we're showing, you know, they're leaning toward Trump, uh, but not that heavily. Um, and so there's a kind of gap here. When we looked underneath it, uh, there's kind of two things going on. It's, it's basically the dynamics that are operative in the general uh, public, there's a gender gap. So Catholic women, uh, much less likely to support Trump than they have, to, than they have been to support uh, Republican candidates in the past. And Catholics with a college education, much less likely to support Trump than they have been willing to support Republican candidates in the past. So that dynamic is affecting uh, the Catholic vote, but it's affecting the Catholic vote more than it's affecting like the white evangelical uh, or the white mainline vote, uh, for example. So that's a kind of interesting uh, dynamic uh, kind of happening in the election right now. All right, so, um, but, but what, what about the trends? Um, and here's, here's what's happening with the trends. So basically we have the same downward trajectory of the percentage of white um, white Christians in the electorate um, over time. But the ballot box, it turns out, because the way these trends are working, is kind of like a little bit of a time machine uh, that takes you back about 10 years, or at least two election cycles, about eight years, uh, to where the population was eight years ago, mostly because white Christians tend to turn out and vote and be registered to vote at higher rates uh, than other Americans do. So it means that they're overrepresented um, at the ballot box. So they get to sort of go back to where the country was maybe two election cycles ago. Um, and so what we're seeing here is that um, we're projecting this year about that 55% of the electorate will be white and Christian, but that's down from 57 um, uh, the last election cycle and down from 61 two election cycles ago. Uh, and that by 2024, that will be the first election where we actually have a minority of white Christians in the electorate uh, itself. So we're really not that far away from the realities that are already with us um, in the general population being with us um, at the ballot box. But one uh, notable thing here is that this, this matters. Um, that there's a pretty good analysis um, that the Associated Press uh, did about Mitt Romney's loss. Um, and as, as you may know, Mitt Romney was convinced all the way up until the you know, 11th hour and then some that he was going to win Ohio and thus win uh, the election. Uh, and, but, he, but he lost. And one of the reasons why he and his pollsters were so uh, misled on this, on this thing is because they made assumptions about what the demographics of the electorate were going to look like. And they based their projections on 2004. Uh, and, and what had happened is that the electorate had changed just enough between 2004 and 2012 that even though he hit all of his marks, he got as much evangelical support, for example, among white evangelicals as George W. Bush did. They turned out at rates uh, that were as high as George W. Bush, and yet he still lost. And the main reason for that is that the demographics, there were just fewer white Christians in the electorate. There weren't enough uh, to put him over the vote. But basically, if he had been able to run his election in 2004, he would have won. Uh, but the demographics has shifted um, out from under him uh, in the meantime. Uh, so that's just the midterm elections. It's basically the same uh, thing. Uh, white Christians do get uh, a little bit of a uh, bonus in midterm elections. It's one of the reasons why we sometimes see midterms roll back things that happened uh, in the general election is that there is a little bit of a kind of white Christian advantage, again, because of a higher turnout rate um, in midterm elections. Um, but if we're looking at the future, um, this is uh, one of the, uh, I think, more important things for thinking about the future of both parties, uh, really, is how reliant are they on this shrinking pool of voters, right? So we see that white Christian voters, uh, white Christians are shrinking in the, in, in the general population, they're shrinking in the electorate, um, but how, how reliant is each party on this? So this blue line is how reliant Democratic presidential candidates have been on white Christian voters over time. So back to 92, uh, Bill Clinton's election, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, his co winning coalition was 60% uh, white and Christian. And as you can see, in each uh, successive election cycle, Democrats have become less and less reliant on white Christian voters. And in fact, um, Barack Obama's uh, coalition was less than four in 10 were white Christian voters that, um, that were in his uh, winning election. Uh, but check this out. Right there is how reliant Republican presidential candidates have been on white Christian voters. Right, so if you go back to the '90s, um, Republican presidential candidates are, uh, you know, a little more than eight and ten uh, reliant on uh, white Christian voters, and they're still about eight and ten reliant on white Christian voters. Uh, this puts them at extreme disadvantage, right, because they're kind of heavily reliant on this shrinking uh, pool of voters. Um, and uh, just to kind of hammer this home, I, I um, dig, dug back up this kind of 
chart on our, this kind of archaeological dig chart has the patterns of white Christian um, uh, percentages in each uh, generational cohort. And I then dropped in Obama's coalition and Romney's coalition into this little matrix uh, to kind of see where they fit generationally. And basically what it shows you is that Obama's coalition by race and religion looked about like 30-year-old America. Uh, but Mitt Romney's coalition looked about like 70-year-old America, right? Uh, and that's part of the challenge here is that the demographics of the appeal of the two parties are, are really um, in different places. <clears throat> um, uh, so, uh, so we're, I'm gonna, well, one more thing on this one. Let me go back here. Uh, the, the one other thing I want to say about this is that uh, the Republican Party, this is not news uh, to the Republican Party, right? Uh, in 2012, after Mitt Romney lost, and they realized that one of the main reasons he lost was because of these demographic shifts, they actually met, came up with this thing that got dubbed the autopsy report in 2013. Uh, and it was really about how do we broaden the tent, how do we reach out, uh, and uh, you know, it was, they're reading the same data that, uh, that's here and saying, well, we've got to figure out how to get, uh, reach Latino voters, younger voters that are more diverse, uh, and uh, came up with a whole set of recommendations that have, for the most part, been roundly ignored uh, by, the, by, uh, by the Trump campaign um, uh, on this, in this election cycle. So we'll, one of the interesting things to see is that what happens, whoever wins, um, what will happen with the Republican Party going forward, uh, because especially if you see this chart, Right, you just realize that like broadening the base is like not really an option if you want to be competitive um, at the national uh, national level um, going forward. Um, all right, so you know where do we go um, from here? Um, uh, one other uh, interesting thing that I wanted to um, kind of show you here is this this chart um, here that I, I think tells us a lot about where we are as a country and some again about what some of that extra stuff that's going on like underneath. The particular debates that make them so contentious um, is really about. Um, we asked this question uh, on a national recent national survey um, that just asked, you know, uh, what do you think? Um, has since the 1950s, do you think American culture and way of life has changed for the better or changed for the worse? Um, and as you can see, um, if you kind of hunt down uh, Democrats and Republicans. Um, these groups are sorted, you know, kind of uh, um, by people who say uh, mostly change for the better, all the way down to mostly change for the worst. You can basically see partisans are on two completely opposite sides of this question, right? Democrats say things that mostly change for the better. Republicans say uh, things that uh, mostly change uh, for the worst. And then you kind of look, and, and the kind of key base groups of each uh, uh, of each group, you know, religiously unaffiliated. Uh, people, um, African Americans, Latino Catholics, uh, all kind of saying things to change for the better. And then you get over there on the other side and it's the Tea Party, white evangelical Protestants uh, saying that things have changed mostly for the worse. Um, and so I want to say one thing about, uh, before I kind of close with a more general comment, but, and we'll take some questions, but one thing I want to say about um, white evangelical Protestants, uh, because I think that has been the key puzzle of this election, um, is um, how have white evangelical Protestants who have build themselves as values voters, right, who care about the character of a candidate and the, uh, and, and the kind of personal life of a candidate, how have they gotten behind Trump and stayed behind Trump uh, throughout this election cycle? I think that's like one of the key kind of head scratchers um, of, the, uh, of the election. Um, so here, here's what I think is going on. Um, I think this, this question actually helps us uh, here, and I, if, I've been reading a lot and listening a lot to what uh, those evangelicals supporting Trump are saying. Essentially, I think it is the last word in his campaign slogan um, that has had the biggest kind of seductive appeal here. So, you know, it's make America great again, right? It's that last word. Uh, and, and you sort of see this data, uh, and then I'll give you a few with like white evangelical Protestants. Um, so on a, just a few questions that give you some flavor. So, so like seven and 10, say things have changed for the worse since the 1950s. Um, two thirds of white evangelicals uh, say that it bothers them when they come across um, immigrants who speak little or no English. Um, and two thirds uh, of white evangelicals say that today, discrimination against whites has become as big a problem as discrimination against blacks and other minorities, right? So this kind of sense of um, uh, kind of reverse discrimination, um, this sense of uh, kind of really a kind of xenophobic streak um, really in, in white evangelicals, I think has 
uh, a big part of the mix here. Uh, and so what, I, what I've argued is that what Donald Trump has essentially done is he's um, converted values voters, what used to be values voters, into what I've been calling nostalgia voters, right? Those who are longing for this time. Uh, and again, back to you know, this, this cultural death that we've really experienced, uh, the end of white Christian America, wanting to bring that time back. Um, so what, you know, what does the 1950s have going for it? It's a time when white Christian churches were bursting at the seams. Um, it's a time when white Christians, in, particularly in the South and the Midwest and other places, had a lot of cultural power. Jim Crow laws were still in the books. Uh, it was pre-civil rights. It was pre-women's rights. It was uh, pre-same-sex marriage being legal in the country. So it's that kind of vision, I think. Um, and and you know, Donald Trump has basically said directly, um, look, when I'm president, I'm going to restore power to the Christian churches. I know you're declining, and I'm going to sort of bring it back. Um, and I think it's that direct appeal, uh, more than him trying to argue that he's one of them, he really hasn't made that argument, uh, that, that has had, uh, that's made this connection. Uh, so the bigger thing here, I guess, is to say this, that um, one of the things I... One helpful lens, I think, it may, you know, it's not the only lens, but I think one helpful lens for understanding the dynamics of this election um, is to think about it as kind of a referendum on the end of white Christian America, the end of this kind of era of white Protestant dominance um, in the country. Um, and, you know, we've got one, and one vision of the country that is a kind of 1950s vision of the country. You think back to that original photo on the opening slide, uh, that vision of the country, and another one that is, um, you know, more that le is leaning in uh, to the, and even celebrating some of the demographic uh, changes in the country. Um, you know, one way of putting it is it 1950 or is it 2050, right? 2050 is the year that the Census uh, Bureau was originally saying that we were going to be uh, a majority non-white country, uh, right? And I think those are the kind of choices uh, and, and that sense uh, that, uh, that something really is at stake more than the issues, uh, but we, we, who are we going to be as a country? Who are we going to be as Americans? How do we even think about the whole idea of America? And I think that's the kind of thing that people are feeling are at stake in this election uh, and this driving, I think, some of the, the energy behind um, what we're seeing in the campaigns. Um, so I'll stop there and we'll um, maybe take some questions. Oh, we do have a mic, okay. We have two? Yeah, one on each aisle? Okay. Uh, great talk, Dr. Jones. Uh, since we're about two or three weeks away from Thanksgiving, I'd like to ask your opinion with all of your research on how Americans still try to show appreciation or thanks for what's good. And let, let, let me give you a hypothetical. Uh, suppose we have a neighbor here uh, in town is very successful in their career, very successful with their family, and without any plan at all about uh, 18 or 19 years ago, uh, was called to step into uh, her spouse's career 3,000 miles away and uh, did so with courage and grace and dignity and integrity for 18 years, and that's going to be ending in eight or 10 weeks. Uh, what is the modern trend for uh, expressing uh, gratitude for someone like uh, Lois Capps, who's sitting with us tonight? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um... Well, I, I, you know, thank goodness for Thanksgiving, right? Um, uh, that, uh, you know, I, I do think it's being one of the, one of the real challenges, I think, is, I mean, the, you know, we think about these campaigns, I mean, they are, they're, they're running longer than they ever have. There's more money dumped into them than there ever has been. Um, and they are, you know, juggernauts of division um, in the country. I mean, you know, no matter what you, whose candidate is whose, um, there is, it's unprecedented how much money is like poured into, I mean, how, you know, just think about just the stuff that has showed up in your mailbox, right? Um, uh, that, that is all about kind of pulling people into their corners. And, and I think part of the, the real challenge for us um, is uh, 
to think about like how how is it that we're going to think about that what's good right in the country not just what's wrong but what's what's good with the country what what does hold us together instead of what just pulls us apart um, I think that that is like the question uh, for us particularly with you know and one of the things I, I hope the book does is is um, I do think we have a unique problem that no other generation has faced um, in this way like it's one thing to say. Um, you know, let's be generous and let's welcome immigrants and all that. When you feel like, uh, you know, particularly if you're in the in that majority, uh, if you feel like you have a secure majority kind of cultural place, right? That's got a secure hold on the center. But when that's gone, it's much less easy, I think, for those who used to be there to be generous, right? They're sort of scrapping for their piece of the pie, and I, I think that's the real challenge. How do we think about what it means to be an American uh, when there isn't one? center around which everybody else has to kind of relate, right? But when it's a much more um, diffuse uh, model. Um, so I, you know, I think it's gonna take some leadership, I mean, for one thing. I mean, so I think that's one of the things I, I hope we get is some leadership that helps us kind of conceptualize. Because I think we're in the need, of, really in the need of some new models for thinking about uh, you know, the country and America. Uh, in the book, just real quickly, in the book I, I, um, I use this uh, example of the Coca-Cola commercial that ran during the Super Bowl, I think during the 2012, and it, it was around America the Beautiful, so it just plays America the Beautiful, but it's this montage of different kinds of Americans, right? And it's black and white and it's gay and straight, there's somebody in hijab and somebody in cowboy boots, and, uh, you know, and, and there was a firestorm of protest over that uh, use of America the Beautiful, um, and with people saying, that's not America, right? That's, what are you talking about? We speak English here in America, you know, those, those kinds of things. Um, and, but, but I think it, that's the debate we have to have, is, is trying to figure out how to put something together um, you know, that still you know, holds us together. I have a question. I noticed yeah. that in your chart, you had um, a category for white mainline Christians and evangelical Christians. Could you um, discuss how you're defining evangelical? Because I know some scholars would treat it as an umbrella term that would include um, denominations and looking at the history of evangelicalism. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about how you're defining that category against the other? Yes, that's a great question. Um, so uh, if you see a story, uh, most, most surveys from uh, PRRI, uh, our organization, Pew, uh, most political scientists, um, what you'll see is this kind of white evangelical Protestant and white mainline Protestant denomination. And so it's divided by uh, race, it's kind of we got a racial divide, and it's got a um, this mainline evangelical. The, the main dividing line there is basically a self identification question that says, Do you consider yourself to be an evangelical or born again Christian or not? And if you say yes to that question, you get put into the evangelical box. And if you say no to that question, you get put into the mainline box. So it's Certainly, an imperfect, you know, thing because there are plenty of Methodists, for example, right, who would say yes, I'm a born again. Especially in the South, who would say yes, I'm a born again Christian. They'll get slotted into that evangelical box uh, instead of the mainline box. So it's imperfect, uh, and it, you can build it up from denominations. It varies a little bit. It turns out it's not drastically different if you build it up from denominations, uh, but there is some of that crossover that you get with the self-identification label. But that's how we do it. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, now I'm in trouble. All right, go ahead. <laughs> so this is a speculative, it's a question for which we can only have speculative answers, but given my sense of what's going on in the country right now, a week before our election, um, whether Trump wins or whether Hillary Clinton wins, the country is going to be in disarray for different reasons in which candidates. We're going to be in disarray. Can a President Trump or a President Clinton bring this country together? Any thoughts you have on that? <laughs> yeah, I, I really do think it's it's a problem, you know, and because and, here's one of the things that, that partisanship has become um, so much stronger. A couple a couple of examples uh, of this. Uh, than, than it has been just even in the recent, uh, recent past. There's a great study by uh, some Stanford uh, sociologists uh, that went back and the, uh, they have a question from like 1960, 1990, and then a, a question not too, in just a couple of years ago where they basically asked, um, uh, how upset would you be if uh, a child of yours married someone of the opposite political party? <laughs> right? Uh, and in the 1960s, it's like, you know, it's like single digits, like, okay, you know, saying that they'd be very upset. It's in the 30s, 
uh, today of people saying, yeah, I'd be pretty upset about that, right? If, if my son or daughter married someone of the opposite political party, that would be a problem. Um, you know, there's polling in this election cycle where people saying I'm scared to talk to my friends about uh, who they're voting for, right? Because I'm worried this is going to like change my opinion of them if I if I like, I don't even want to know, um, kind of thing. Um, you know, the, the, and that's that's kind of new. Um, and what 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 we're seeing really is that um, people are not just taking their partisan identity to the ballot box; they're like taking it to bed, right? Um, it, it just kind of is part of their identity, um, and and that that's something I think that has has been building for quite some time. Uh, but it, it does mean, though, that once it becomes a kind of tribal identity, um, it becomes you don't interrogate it anymore, right? It just becomes part of who you are, um, and so then certain things become unthinkable and certain things become natural without ever. Uh, sort of you know, passing through a kind of filter uh, of, of, of kind of thoughtfulness. And so I think that's, that's kind of figuring out how to get around that, I think, um, where there's this kind of just this antipathy of, uh, you know, there's also other data showing um, that like people now no longer say, I, I disagree with the person of the other party, but like I think they're going to do harm to the country, right? That's that's the kind of thing I think about people from the other party, and th it goes both both directions. Um, and that that becomes much more difficult, I think, to kind of build kind of civic integration of any kind uh, when you have this kind of partisan divides being that strong. So, yep, you here, yep. I think you may have answered my question, but um, so one of the things that I, I think about, especially looking at the data, is you know you you speak about the the rise of partisanship, and yet. Looking at the data, it looks like there's um, a rise in pluralism, right, in, in our country. So my question was related to how likely, and this may go beyond the scope of you know the data that you have and 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 the rhetoric and the things that you've studied, but how likely is it that our country may, in fact, over time, progress into more of a like a pluralism in politics? rather than this sort of binary partisanship, because it does seem like with the rise of pluralism, we're forcing these populations to choose one side or the other, um, where the politics isn't really reflective of, of the country anymore. Yeah. No, it, it's a great question about political parties. I, I don't see any realistic hope for a third party. Like any, you know, what I, what I think can happen is I think the parties can change, and they have. Uh, change. I mean, you, just, you don't have to go back to even to the middle of the 20th century, and the Democratic Party and the Republican Party are very different than they are uh, today, right? I mean, the Democratic Party was very successful in the South uh, prior to the Civil Rights uh, Movement, right? Now it's the solid Republican South. So we have seen these kinds of switches uh, in the country, um, but I, I don't see any prospects for there being kind of a third uh, a third party in. But and, but part of the problem is is that um, what we're you know the the patterns we're seeing is. Uh, this kind of homogeneity, really, in the Republican Party, with most of the kind of you know what you might put into the category of pluralism flowing into the Democratic side, and just you know one example are Latinos here, right? George W. Bush got forty some odd percent of for depending on which poll you look at, at least forty percent of the Latino vote, right? No Republican candidate has come anywhere near that. Uh, that percentage of the Latino vote, so that's you know that's that's a pretty good s split, right? 40-60, um, and it, but Barack Obama got 75% uh, of it, and it looks like he, um, you know Hillary Clinton may get 80% uh, of the Latino vote um, this time. So then you get this very lopsided uh, kind of you know uh, divide that runs along. I think that's that's the real danger. I think is that you get race, religion, uh, and party like all lined up together, right? That's a force that's really hard. Uh, to undo. So. so my question has to do with sort of the core Christian message. Your, your research has identified people who label themselves as these things that you've talked about, but the core Christian message seems to me to be about love, so therefore, of course, I wonder if any of your research at all deals with why, given what the core Christian message is, why is it so lopsided in terms of um, the content of their, I mean, their label, their self-label versus what that should mean. Yeah, um, so that's a little probably beyond my, my sociologist bent, um, but I'll, I'll, I'll say this, um, you know, um, it's always been the case. I mean, I evoke Lincoln a little, uh, Abraham Lincoln at the end of the book a little bit, kind of talking about someone who's trying to stitch a country together, right, at a very contentious moment. Um, and, but, you know, one of the things, you know, I mean, Lincoln's second inaugural address is like so eloquent on this point, right? 
uh, both sides prayed to the same God, both sides called for you know, the same divine help, uh, and neither of these folks, could, they couldn't both be right, right, over the issue of slavery, uh, for example. Um, so, you know, like I, as, as someone who you know, grew up religious and as a religious person, I appreciate the sentiment of it being about love, but I mean, re but religion's also been about segregation and religion's also been about oppression and um, that's, that history has to be taken into account, right? And I, I think it's, it's always the sort of case when you've got a human institution uh, struggling with these aspirations, you know, you've got these gaps and the power of race uh, the power of gender, I mean, the power of like, all these, uh, and party, I mean, that's the crazy thing. I mean, the way that party divides religious groups now, I mean, is, is really amazing, and party and ideology. I mean, it used to be that those lines ran between denominations. They run right through denominations now, right? I mean, the Presbyterians sitting, the Republican Presbyterian sitting on one end of the pew and the Democratic Presbyterian sitting on the other end of the pew may have more in common with the kind of Republican Catholic across town than they do with their fellow Presbyterian on the other, any other end of the pew uh, these days. So yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's tough. Um, yeah. <laughs> Let's thank Robert for this great address. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.